when Fred invited me to come up to San Francisco and to speak with you, I asked him, what might I talk about in your opinion that could be most useful to this group? Rather than simply select some topic that might be on my mind, I wanted to see if I could be most usefully relevant. And he gave me a request, easy in some ways, very difficult in others. He said, well, he consulted with some colleagues to get some feedback, and he said, here's the word, be personal. <laughs> I think that meant don't discuss ideas in the abstract, don't discuss the world, don't discuss strategies, say something about your personal evolution relative to liberation, hence the title Liberation, a Personal Scenario. Well, that was for me rather interesting and awesome because any life that's progressing at all, the very nature of human development can be understood from the perspective of liberation. The whole process of growth is a process of opening doors to new possibilities so that anybody who is engaged in the process of growing or trying to open up to the possibilities of life could give a talk called Liberation of Personal Scenario and it would fit. So I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit random and I hope not too scattered as I share with you some memories and observations relative to liberation, libertarianism, personal evolution and the like. And I don't think that too many of you will be surprised if I tell you that the story began when I read The Fountainhead at the age of 14, when living in Toronto, and fell in love with the book and felt that it spoke to me in the most intimate way possible, and proceeded to drive my family to distraction, being uninterested in talking about anything else. <laughs> But something very fateful happened in Toronto in the 14th year of my life, which was this. My mother became concerned that perhaps the fountainhead was becoming an obsession. God forbid. <laughs> and there was this friend of the family, a teacher, who my mother thought was an intellectual and might be invited to offer some kind of judgment on whatever influence her son had fallen under. So this lady came to visit us. She hadn't read The Fountainhead, and I was glad to give her a synopsis. <laughs> and then I invited her to read Howard Rourke's courtroom speech, preparatory to us having a real good discussion. My mother, perhaps I should mention, understood none of this. Uh, she was not a reader, but she just sensed something was up. And what she wanted to know was, is it good or bad for her son? As, as mothers are wont to ask, right? So when the visitor finished the courtroom speech, she said to me in the most pleasant, easy, matter-of-fact way possible, well, this is very interesting. Of course, it's not new. There is a name for this philosophy. And I said, really, what is it? And she said, it's called anarchism. <laughs> I debated, should I tell this story or not? I don't want to give aid and comfort to a viewpoint I do not share. <laughs> I will take it, pin my hopes on the, the total picture emerging clearly. Anyway. <coughs> I can't explain why, but I knew that, what, that this was untrue, meaning that this was something new and that she was wrong. But I didn't know how to prove this. So what I did was the next day I skipped school and I went down to a branch of the Toronto Public Library. And I walked up to one of the librarians and I said, would you please show me how to find a book on anarchism? I have to find out what anarchism is. And fate directed me 
or someone directed me to an interesting little book by the British philosopher Burton Russell called Proposed Roads to Freedom, a study of anarchism, socialism, and syndicalism. And uh, I read the book that day in the Toronto Public Library, and I became confirmed in my understanding that that was not indeed what, what the Fountainhead was teaching. I didn't yet know what politically the Fountainhead was teaching, which is a funny story in itself, but I somehow knew it was not the chapter on anarchism in Bertrand Russell's book. But the reading was very fortuitous because it really turned me on to reading about political philosophy. And because the first book happened to have been written by a philosopher, it turned me on to reading more of Bertrand Russell. So when I was 14, I discovered philosophy. And in the same year, I discovered psychology. And in the same year, I failed second year high school because... <laughs> <laughs> this is the very first time I have ever been applauded for failing high school. It's justified my whole trip to San Francisco. <laughs> well, what happened was that I was so mesmerized by the world that had opened up to me that how could my poor high school teachers be expected to compete? <laughs> trying to get me to learn French, you know, or geometry. So I became a master forger at the age of 14 because I had to have these notes from my mother explaining that I was sick. And the, the joke is that nobody ever found out what I did. I was absent from school an awful lot, and I wasn't playing around. I mean, I wasn't lazy. I was down on the Toronto Public Library reading and reading and reading, but... I failed school. Unfortunately, there was a special school where you could take four years of high school in one year. It was for people like uh, returning from the war. This was 1943 and people coming out of the service and policemen who want to go back to school. And it's a special crash course. And I was so mortified, I begged my mother to let me go there and knock off high school. And she said, if you failed second year, how can you do four years in one? And I said, trust me, I will do it. And I did. And in fact, I got the highest grades I ever got up to that time. But that was fateful for me because through these chain of events, the whole world of philosophy and psychology opened to me. So that was the beginning of a kind of liberation because it meant, and this theme will become important in a few minutes, new choices new possibilities for me. Now, jumping ahead five or six years, in my adolescence, most of the intellectually inclined people that I knew were socialist or communist in Toronto. And I was convinced that there was no excuse for the evil of any group forcing its ideas or beliefs on any other group. And that's clearly what was entailed in any species of socialism or syndicalism or communism. And from that point of view, anarchism seemed very logical because it seemed the only alternative that didn't entail uh, coercion. What was completely absent from my education, and what I never found anywhere, neither in discussions with relatives nor in my reading, was the concept of capitalism. Meaning, it wasn't even an option. There were the whole idea of limited constitutional government, or Jeffersonian democracy, or the idea of a government that would be more or less committed to the protection of individual rights, wasn't raised and dismissed. It was as if no such system or anything like it had ever been known. So I was wondering what in hell does Ayn Rand believe in politically? That became my obsession. I somehow knew, and don't ask me why, she was not an anarchist. So I wrote her a letter. And I tell her how much I admired her books, and I said, could you please tell me what political system do you believe in? Certainly not capitalism, but what is it then? <laughs> because all I ever heard about capitalism, you know, was uh, imperialism and colonialism. Can you imagine your only knowledge of capitalism coming from Marxists? <laughs> 
Well, that was the condition of a lot of people on the 1940s of my age. Some of you, no doubt. So she didn't answer that letter, but she answered another letter a little bit later in which she said, if you're the gentleman who wrote me from Canada, I hope by now you have learned that I am an advocate of total, free, pure, uncontrolled, unregulated, laissez-faire capitalism. Capitalism underscored in ink twice. <laughs> Now, by now, I had really absorbed the philosophy of the fountainhead very well, and I struggled with what this could mean, because I really did not know what capitalism was, and I had no clue as to how to find out. It's now 1949. The only people I knew to ask would be either giving me a Marxist perspective or a very cynical, pragmatic, non-ideological perspective that would not really illuminate what I wanted to know. I was so heartened by her writing me this little note that I took my courage in my hands and now I wrote her a long letter explaining, asking some questions and explaining some of her mistakes. <laughs> Challenging her, that's a slight exaggeration for the purpose of humor, but challenging her on certain issues. And my letter intrigued her because she felt the points I was making were valid. For example, I, I called her on some of the sentences in the original version of We the Living, which she cut and removed in a later edition of We the Living. Stuff like that. But the letter impressed her, and in... Uh, February of, of 1950, while going to UCLA... Uh, I get a letter from her, a long, wonderful, terrific, exciting letter, beginning to introduce me to what is capitalism. And saying if I had more questions, perhaps a personal meeting could be arranged and let me give her my phone number and perhaps she'll call me. And she told me, I cannot undertake to educate you from scratch. So you have to do something on your own. There's two books I want you to read before I talk to you again. Henry Hazlitt's Economics and One Lesson, and Isabel Patterson, The God of the Machine. And I can see some of you smiling and nodding. Well, coming out of my background, it was incredibly exciting to read these books and get introduced to a way of thinking about social issues for which nothing that I had heard at home, nothing that I had read, had remotely prepared me. But mostly what I got was like a rough sketch of a vision. I didn't feel complete or finished with the issue at all. But I was very turned on, very intellectually excited. So um, the last week of February in 1950, one night I'm very tired and I go to bed early and at 9.30 at night the phone rings and I'm really feeling groggy. And I stumble over to the telephone and I say hello and this thick Russian accent says, is this Mr. So-and-so me? I says, yes. And she says, this is Ayn Rand speaking. And that's how... We had some uh, unfortunate experiences many, many years later that uh, you may have heard a word or two about. <laughs> but they are really irrelevant now, because now I want to recreate a very happy period. And one of my differences from Ian is that I'm able to keep those two issues very separate. And I'm not going to rewrite history and allow the unhappy things that happened later cause me to be negative about some of the great experiences that happened when I was younger. Anyway, we're talking, I, I go there a week later and I won't take the time to tell you the whole story of how we met and became friends and then everything else, but <laughs> on that, uh, I should have constructed that sentence in some other way. <laughs> This evening is very exciting, and we're talking all over the map about ethics and literature and everything but capitalism, which is my official reason for being there. Finally, it's getting close to midnight, and I start asking her about capitalism. And I still don't quite have the vision of what is the system? What is it? Something was, because 
The Haslip book, which I think is outstanding, it's still, I think, the greatest book to begin with of anything I've ever read and to reread every few years. I didn't have what I needed philosophically yet, and that's important to where I want to go tonight. So she said, I'll give you the case for capitalism that isn't in those books. It's really contained in the fountainhead, although I'm writing a longer novel now of which one of my purposes is to provide a moral or an ethical defense of capitalism. But she says the principle is in the fountainhead, and you understand the fountainhead and you'll get this. She said, do you believe that the human being has the right to exist? As is by now one of the leading authorities in the fountainhead, of course I drew myself and I've said, Miss Rand, of course I do. She said, do you understand that the right to exist means the right to exist for one's own sake? I said, with as much poise as I could command, Miss Rand, of course. If he doesn't have the, if, if he doesn't have the right to exist for his own sake, then basically he's existing by permission. She said, the political implementation of that concept is capitalism. And I said, oh. <laughs> and it was like a tremendous light going on because everything else that happened, reading von Mises, reading von Bauerk, all the studying I did later was a footnote to that moment. It was an electrifying experience because it's not that easy for most of us to date a particular moment in our life when a massive issue becomes illuminated for us. Usually it's a slower, subtler process extended over time. But since my primary interest was philosophical, ethical, rather than narrowly political or economic, that moral perspective was supremely important and what I needed in order to be able to fit capitalism into the moral vision that had so inspired me in the fountainhead. In other words, I saw the obvious linkage, it's obvious after it's made obvious, between capitalism on the one hand and individualism and enlightened self-interest on the other hand. It was that integration that suddenly made the advocacy of a free market and of a social system organized around the inviolability of individual rights as a natural consequence of a way of looking at, at man, at humankind, at what is the good, of what is life all about. So that for me, capitalism, the advocacy of capitalism from the beginning was charged with moral energy. It felt like a crusading issue, it felt like a fighting issue in the most intoxicating and exciting sense because it mere, it wasn't, I don't want to demean practicality, I don't want to demean human comfort, but it was not simply a system that worked better than the alternative systems. It wasn't only a system that produced goods and services more effectively that allowed a more efficient flow of human energy. That was all true, but what was important for me was that it was the one system fit for human consumption, you see. Now at that time, libertarianism didn't exist as a word in the sense that it exists now. And shooting ahead a number of years, we would talk about the fact that capitalism was an unfortunate word for two reasons, perhaps. One, because Marx had used it as an abusive term to describe a market economy. And two, because it was purely an economic term as it was used. And there was no word to name in a single expression the concept of a society organized on the principle of the inviolability of individual rights in which the exclusive function of government would be the protection of rights with the obvious corollary of a separation of state and economics, right? 
So when the word libertarianism first began to be talked about, I liked it and I didn't for an odd reason. I liked it because I would have taken any word. <laughs> the vacuum, the need for a word to name that concept was really important. And I didn't, on an almost literary ground, this was before any of the differences between her and certain libertarians that arose later, such as libertarianism encompassing those who didn't believe in any form of government, however limited. Those issues arose only later. Her first objection, strangely enough, was to me puzzlingly literary. She found the word awkward. And uh, at that time, there was nothing really to debate about because there was no libertarian movement, there was no libertarian party. And uh, I just welcomed the word because I knew a word is desperately needed. And by the way, I have to say this because the libertarian party does include both those who believe in uh, limited government and those who don't uh, accept the validity under any circumstances of an institution of government, that when I speak of libertarianism, I understand by it a social, political, economic system based on individual rights in which the sole and exclusive function of government is the protection of those rights, and but that is a legitimate function in my view. Okay, so... What is important for me was that in the years that followed, and of course this was true for a good many of you, I would guess, the advocacy of uh, capitalism or what we later called libertarianism was part and parcel for me of objectivism. It was part and parcel of a comprehensive philosophical system of which it was a part. It didn't exist in a vacuum. And we had a lot of arguments with supporters of capitalism, even people we liked and admired. Ludwig von Mises would be the most extreme example, certainly someone that we both admired enormously, or Mr. Hazlitt being another. And some of what we argued about is relevance to, relevant to certain trends in libertarianism today. We said, look, in the 19th century, we passed through a period where among intellectuals in the Western world, capitalism had demonstrated its supremacy. Socialism was perceived to be refuted, disqualified, and passé. You go back to the mid-19th century. The practical argument for capitalism has already been demonstrated. More of this, and yet the world has turned away more and more in the 20th century back toward totalitarianism. While it's exceedingly important to know the practical defense of capitalism, it's not adequate. You need underneath that a moral defense, you need a philosophical defense, you have to deal with why we were unable to keep it the first time around. And if you don't address that issue, any temporary victories will always be uh, delicate, will always be fragile. Now, in my estimation, that's relevant for libertarians to think about today because following the Rand Brandon break, following the explosion at NBI, A lot of people went their separate ways, and there was a lot of backlash against objectivism, against Ayn Rand, against Nathaniel Brennan. A lot of it thoroughly understandable, and some of it unfortunately mistaken. There was a lot, in my estimation, of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. By that I mean There were elements in what we had been saying, or what Ian was continuing to say following our break, that would have antagonized anybody. Uh, she was personally autocratic in the extreme. She was a doctrinaire in a way that didn't support the free exchange of ideas. She was ferociously obsessed with personal loyalty. In other words, she was very much like most people are, who are pioneers of new intellectual movements and as they get a little bit older become more and more obsessed with protecting the true body of faith. There's nothing, as I later learned, 
unique about her faults in the world of uh, my own profession of psychology, for example, you look at the last years of a man like Wilhelm Reich, or you look at Sigmund Freud with his rings that he gave to his seven disciples who were to be the guardians of the true faith. Uh, I realized that a lot of experiences that for me I regarded as, boy, my tough experiences were really like an archetype of what tends to happen in intellectual movements. When a person has had to maintain a solitary position against terrific opposition for decades, you do get bitter, you do get suspicious, you get very, very cranky. Uh, uh, and the fact that you may be a genius doesn't necessarily improve the quality of your disposition or your way of dealing with your friends. So what? I mean, that's all true and it's important if you're a friend, but it's not important in the wider sense to uh, the intellectual movement that interests us, right? What concerned me in the later years was the idea of libertarians who really thought that they could fly with one precept, non-initiation of physical force. As if the only thing you needed to go into battle with, in addition to your practical economic arguments, was the idea that no individual or no group may initiate the use of physical force against others. Now, no one rates the importance of that concept higher than I. But you can't change the world with that concept in an intellectual vacuum. You can't divorce it from the concept of individual rights because without the concept of individual rights, you will not be able to answer somebody who says, why can't you force people if the welfare of the world or society or the common good requires it? What makes the individual so bloody sacred? What's so sacrosanct about an individual's voluntary choice when the welfare of humanity is at issue? So the logic of the interrelatedness of ideas obligates us to be philosophical thinkers whether we are inclined to be or not, to some extent at least. We don't have to become masters of epistemology or metaphysics or metaethics, but we have to have some grasp of the philosophical foundations necessary to defend freedom, to defend uh, our view of individual rights, or we are going to be a very, very limited effectiveness. And the fact that right now we are moving through a period of history where there seems to be, uh, what will I call it, a pro-capitalism swing, a pro-freedom swing, a disillusionment and suspiciousness about government swing, I don't think any of you need to be convinced by me that the swings of that kind can change very, very easily. I don't see any radical change of anybody's philosophical beliefs or convictions about anything in the last two or three decades. I think there's a growing disenchantment with what socialist governments have achieved around the world, and there's certainly a growing disenchantment with our past democratic or republican administrations. So there is a kind of public mood which is more pro-free enterprise, but I am not aware that it represents any kind of fundamental rethinking or rechallenging of the ideas behind the New Deal or the welfare state. And if, if someone has evidence to think that something radical has altered in people's thinking, I would welcome hearing about it, because I think that the great battle of fighting for individualism, enlightened or rational self-interest, and the absolute inviolability of individual rights is as major, as central, and formidable as it ever was. It's just that the climate is a little bit more receptive right now. And I know that there's one issue that some libertarians have felt queasy about or uncomfortable with, and that's anything that sounds like taking on altruism. And uh, taking on that holy sacred cow. I am personally convinced that we have to be willing to deal with that issue 
because it's inseparably tied to all the other issues that presumably we share convictions about. If you really believe that a human life is an end in itself and not the means to the ends of others, if you really are convinced that you are an end in yourself and so is the person sitting beside you, you can't simultaneously believe that the person only has a right to exist, maybe serve as others. And if you really believe consistently with a full understanding of what it means that you are an end in, the, in, in, in yourself, then you are at odds with a very long tradition. You are definitely not in the mainstream. And I think we have to have the common sense, matter of fact, honesty to appreciate the fact that we are trying to advance an idea that is very daring, very radical, very revolutionary, and very imperfectly understood. I think that the idea that a human being has the right to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is truly as radical an idea in 1987 as it was when it was first expressed in public and not significantly better understood. A person has a right to the pursuit of happiness? Now I think making a very large jump that's why there's so much nonsense about this television show coming up called America. I have no idea whether this TV movie is going to be any good or not. I suspect it isn't. <laughs> but I think, I think that the attacks on it in advance of what's happening is scandalous, disgraceful, and very, very relevant. And to bring this issue into focus, I want to ask you one question. Picture that the year is 19... Late 1939 or early 1940. And imagine that somebody makes a movie and wants to show what America would look like occupied by the Nazis. After all, most of America was isolationist at that time. Most of America didn't want to get involved in Europe at that time. I don't think that the people who are screaming their heads off today over this uh, film would be screaming their heads off then because uh, Russia and communism have always enjoyed a special privileged position with regard to American intellectuals. They have never been looked at by the same set of rules the Nazism was looked at. They may in the abstract say that both are uh, inhuman totalitarian systems in the abstract, but communism is so inexorably linked to uh, the concept of the public good, the common good, service to mankind, all the precepts of altruism, that it has never been held by most American intellectuals accountable or answerable for its atrocities in the way that other fascist totalitarianisms have been. And I don't think we can ever understand the special rules, the special exemptions made for Russia if we don't understand the supreme importance ethically of the whole issue of individualism versus self-sacrifice or egoism versus altruism or however you want to conceptualize that issue. But I'll assume we all understand what I'm talking about. So what I want to suggest to you, if we're interested in liberation, is that uh, we can... Uh, separate from other features of a philosophy we may not fully share. We may want to separate from the personality of Ayn Rand, from the behavior of any of her exponents. But there are certain core ideas which I don't know how we can separate from and still be meaningfully libertarian. And I would love to see at future conferences dialogue on this issue on what it is, to, what is it that we are saying when we're saying we're libertarian. Now, as, as Dr. Hosmer said in his talk earlier today, there's lots of areas of legitimate disagreement among libertarians who agree in principle. An agreement on principle on the broad precepts of libertarianism leaves lots of room for disagreement about matters of law, foreign policy, and the like. But I think there are some issues without which we cannot defend the concept of freedom or libertarianism or free market. 
A pragmatic defense has been tried. It didn't work the first time around. I'm absolutely convinced it won't work the second time around. I was wondering, what could I say that might be useful? Because progressively in the last several years, coming back to the personal, I've moved into a different kind of libertarianism. And now I'm speaking slightly ironically. I've moved into the territory of personal liberation. When I left uh, objectivism or the institution of the Nathaniel Brandon Institute and went back into the practice of psychotherapy because psychotherapy has a lot to do with libertarianism, interestingly enough, and that's what I thought would be worth clarifying. And that's, for me, the same passion that led me to wanting to fight for capitalism is very much present in my approach to psychology and psychotherapy. Because what is libertarianism concerned with? Libertarianism is concerned with the external blocks to individual self-realization. Psychotherapy is concerned with the removal of the internal blocks. Both are concerned with that great issue, freedom to choose. And I've long been fascinated by the parallelism between those who are concerned to remove external st uh, obstacles, coercive obstacles, with those who are interested in optimizing the possibility psychologically of free choice. Because what I find very interesting is to think about the fact that wherever you look in human experience, there is a common meaning to the concept of progress or evolution, whether you think politically, technologically, evolutionarily, or psychologically. If you are talking in evolutionary terms, for example, and you say one species is more highly evolved than another, do you know what that comes down to? In any given situation, more options are possible to the more evolved species than to the less evolved species. The more evolved the species, the more things its representatives can do in any situation, the more possibilities exist for it. The options available to an amoeba are exceedingly limited. Those to a uh, earthworm, far greater. Those to a chimpanzee, almost immeasurably greater. And those to a human, greater again. If you think about technology, what does evolution or progress mean? It means more choices, giving people more choices. Take one of the greatest technological inventions in the history of the human race, one of the most benevolent, benign, kindly, loving, warm, and compassionate, the invention of effective birth control. Now, what was so great about this bit of technological achievement? Look what it did in terms of human choice. Look how it affected the possibility to choose your lifestyle and your life. All right? If you own a car, you have some more choices than if you don't own a car in most parts of the world. Not all, but in most. All right? Now, in psychology, if a person is anxious or depressed or inhibited or repressed or blocked or he's always got headaches or he's got certain self-doubts which render him less effectual by far than he could be and we're able to assist him through working with him or her, what are we doing? We're not taking away the ability to have, to be limited, you know, you can, but we're giving choices where choices didn't exist in any practical sense before. So, for example, a person is so depressed he doesn't get out of bed in the morning, doesn't want to go to work, doesn't want to do anything. Well, And then you help the person to get rid of the depression. You don't take away the ability to stay in bed that day, but you give a choice. Now you could get out and have a good time, you see. So you give a choice. Now, what is the fight for political freedom all about? It's giving people more options, more choices. That's one of the many reasons why I so much admire uh, Dr. Freeman's film series, Free to Choose, because that is the issue, free to choose. But why is free to choose so important? Why is it for me the very same issue, whether I'm arguing with somebody about capitalism or thinking about how to help somebody with emotional repression? 
It's the same issue. It's how much you care about individual life. It's how it's 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 always an issue of what you think about man or woman as an individual, what you think about an individual's right to his or her own life, whether or not that issue has moral and emotional charge for you. Now, if it doesn't, and I believe that for most of us it does, I don't think you folks are really here because you are your heart is really in practical politics. Uh, I cannot believe that. My, my guess is that to varying extents, you have very strong feelings about these issues, and you kind of enjoy being part of a crusade that feels worthwhile to you and worth fighting for. Is that a correct assumption on my part? All right. So I think that we are crusaders, and I think it's one of the most exciting and satisfying things in the world to be, providing we know what we're doing. I don't mean hysterical crusaders or, you know, inappropriate, off-the-wall, messianic crusaders, as I've heard one or two libertarians or objectivists have been known to be. I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about people who have a strong moral passion, who have convictions about the good for human beings, and are willing to put their energies on the line. So... What I wanted to share with you is, is from a, aside from a small bit of autobiography, not much, I'll be sharing more later, but not for a while, uh, is uh, inviting you to think about the philosophical underpinnings of your passion. Think about if it isn't an arbitrary proposition hanging, hanging in a vacuum, no initiation of force, what view of human beings, what view of life, what view of man, what view of reality do we need to support libertarianism? And don't we want to be identified not just with the final product, namely the advocacy of liberty, but with the whole moral vision? Aren't we, in a certain sense, moral visionaries? Even when we're discussing the most practical, pragmatic issues. And don't we maybe sometimes need to remind ourselves of that? To reach inside ourselves and remember the internal considerations that brought us here. I'm convinced the more conscious they are, the more effective we can be. I've nowhere said everything that I want to say, but time is running short, and I'll be very frustrated if I can't have a little bit of exchange in terms of questions and get some a activity going back and forth. So I'm going to interrupt myself just so we can talk back and forth a little bit. Okay? Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I really was hoping that I'd have to deal with some questions because I like feedback. I like the sense of who I'm talking to. What are your thoughts or reactions to what I'm saying? You want to give me an argument? Give me an argument. You want to ask a further question? Fire away. Yes. Okay, let me try to explain in more depth. I think a great deal is going our way, or rather, I think libertarians are doing a great deal that is fantastic in terms not just of the party, but of the think tanks, the magazines, the spreading of the ideas. But now, I'm not talking about what self-conscious libertarians are doing, 
because I think they're doing a great deal that is tremendously valuable and important. So that's not my focus. My focus here is a different one. I am saying that what I'm seeing is a lot of practical disenchantment with, quote, big government. But I don't see anybody rethinking whether he or she personally wants handouts. I don't see any rethinking. I see. I see. I mean, what are, why is it so hard for politicians uh, to do serious budget cutting? I don't think it's just. I think that one of the reasons is is because everybody wants the cut somewhere else. You know, very few people say no. We shouldn't cut the budget. That's not the problem. I'm saying. Now, as I say, there could be signs that you see, because you probably followed this more closely than I do, and then maybe somebody write me a letter and tell me what I should be reading. What I'm not seeing, and I mean, I would love to be wrong on this point. I think it's encouraging. I think it's exciting. I think it's a fantastic moment in history to be a libertarian. And I, and I also think that if we don't take appropriate advantage of it, the winds of change can sweep it away. All right. Yes. Well, in this area, uh, it will come as no surprise that I very much share Rand's perspective. And to remind you of an, of an extremely condensed version of how I would approach this, without the concept of individual life, you can't even arrive at the idea of importance or unimportance in the human realm that the whole concept of the good or the bad or a value genetically bears a certain logical relationship to the value of life which it presupposes and that you can't even make sense of those concepts you can't even make them fully intelligible without first getting into the question of why do human beings need such concepts as morally important or unimportant good or bad desirable or undesirable and for further details of course I would refer you to Rand's own writings, and if you want to know how I explain it, uh, read the chapter called Egoism and Honoring the Self for what I think is probably the clearest summary in one place of my answer to that question. But uh, it is the great question. It is the great question, and I don't think, it's, I don't think anybody thinks it's enough to say, well, because I say so. We do have to... It isn't that we drag those philosophical arguments into every encounter. All the time when we're talking, we're not putting everything out that's in our mind behind. But we have to know. We have to know. Because sooner or later, we will be, answer we will be held accountable for our ability or inability to answer those questions. Yeah. One of the more me one of the more serious uh, trends that I see right now that I'm very disturbed about is the religious right and I'm wondering what your comments are I understand that you're not terribly uh, enthusiastic about it <laughs> <laughs> well I am only I am only enthusiastic about this in one respect it's a magnificent opportunity for us to separate ourselves <laughs> from a group with whom we are sometimes uh, identified so that we can be smeared. Uh, I hope I'm not over-optimistic. I am unable to persuade myself that this represents a serious threat to anybody. Uh, it's very interesting. I think it was Time magazine gave an interesting report even among people who label themselves as religious fundamentalists, who are part of the so-called moral majority, when it came down to 
do you personally favor legislation to enforce your particular viewpoint? Somewhat to the surprise of the time pollsters, a clear majority were against it, even though they had strong personal feelings about it. In other words, there is still some very interesting, what shall I call it, American impulse that says, let us not allow religion and politics to spend too much time in bed together. <laughs> that concern still appears to be there. I hope I'm reading the situation accurately. Yes? Dr. Brandon, what are three things you would do in therapy to give someone more choice? The favorite thing I love to do is to say, if you didn't have this problem, now I know you've got it, but if you didn't have it, what do you imagine you could be doing this week? You understand? So, so, and then I get the person to make a list. And I say, I know you cannot do that because you've got this terrific problem. And after we have a list, I'll say, now look, I know we haven't solved the problem yet, but even with the problem, is there anything you could do this week? that could improve the situation. And you know, nobody has ever said to me in my career, absolutely nothing. <laughs> so in other words, what I'm really saying is, part of the task is to alert people to the fact that choices exist that their self-concept prevents them from seeing. They're saying, well, I'm scared, so I can't do this. So part of what you want to do is device means to help them to become aware that even at the present time, there are options and choices, you see. And uh, so that is process number one. Process number two is to first get them to assure me in my office that they absolutely can't do something, like sentence completion. Then get them to do something that they swore to me they couldn't do. Because when they see that they've just done something that they told me they absolutely couldn't have done, it, we now have a better context in which to discuss what's possible and what isn't. Okay? Well, to do, <laughs> I could, because, you know, I, this would be a trap for me. I so much love talking on this subject, and I could be answering you for the next 10 minutes. Yes? may lie in the fact that the collective has endured for century upon century, whereas individual human lives have been snuffed out by our, bi by our biology in a matter of a few tens of thousands of days. Uh, do you think that perhaps the prospect of greatly extending healthy individual human lives might increase the tendency of people to value individual human life? No. no? I'll tell you why. <laughs> no. no, of course not. No, I'll tell you why. Relax. I'm going to tell you why. It's very simple. Point one. Individuals don't last a long time, and collectives don't last a long time. Hold it. New individuals arise, and new collectives arise. The, co the collective that existed 100 years ago didn't last a long time. With a handful of exceptions, it's dead. This is now a different one. Same way with individuals. If I say the individuals existed for thousands of years, that's a metaphor. It's an abstraction. Individuals come into existence and go out of existence. Groups consist of individuals who come into existence or go out of existence. Now, unless you're talking about very primitive forms of life that have lived a long time, which is not too exciting an argument, if you're talking about human collectives, uh, then I think that you will, if you don't solve anything else, the problems will become worse. And I'll tell you why. Because unless you are simultaneously developing interplanetary travel, yeah. <laughs> the problem will then be, what are we going to do? People have to get out of the way to make room for the next generation. So I, don't, I think we'll have some new, very exciting problems. See, I don't, when we have uh, life extension, see, I think this, uh, I have at least failed to persuade you of my core point. You think technology is going to do it. 
It didn't do it in the 19th century, and it won't do it in the 23rd. You know why not? Because, I really got to catch an airplane, because so long as there is human envy, so long as somebody is sore because you're better looking or have a higher IQ or earn more money, and technology is not going to eradicate that except if it kills us all. So long as there is human envy, so long as there are differences in human energy and human ambition and human talent, you are always going to have to deal with the socialist mentality, whatever its name may be. Always. You will always have to defend the individual. And saying, well, what do you care? You know, we'll freeze you and next time around you'll be rich and good looking. I don't think I don't think that'll fly, Eric. I don't. With respect, one more question. I really have to disappear, Tom. You may have just answered my question, but if you take the position that benevolence, and kindness, and charity are positive qualities, and therefore they're not inherently bad, which I do. Right. How do you respond to the, the, the desire, the, the, the very quick desire amongst kind, generous, benevolent people to incorporate the values in government? That's why nothing will work without the concept of individual rights. That's why it's the pillar without which the whole structure collapses. And that's why I know there are libertarians who don't regard rights as an essential part of the argument. And I think they are misguided at best. Uh, because everything you're saying is true. There is a problem there. And you have to be able to say, people want to practice private altruism? Fine. You do not use physical violence to compel some people to act out other people's altruistic impulses, you see. You know, I was once invited, and allow me to end with this thought, Laser. I was once invited to address a group of Mensa people in Los Angeles. And they asked me to speak on something very strange sounding called libertarianism. Mensa, by the way, is an organization, in case you don't know it, of people who have a, an IQ. They're in the top two percentile. You'd never know it in political discussions. In any, <laughs> in any event, <laughs> after the, at the wind-up of the question period, at a moment like this, I said, ladies and gentlemen, somehow we had gotten talking about utopias or visions of the future. So I said, whenever people talk to me about utopias, I have only one question I'd like to ask, and I'll leave that question with all of you, I said to them. Because everything else is important, no doubt, but it's also a footnote. I said, whatever utopia you're dreaming up for the future, I just want to know one thing about it. Is it going to be a utopia in which some people have the political right to impose their theories of the good on other people? If it isn't, it will, we could have an interesting conversation. <laughs> but if it is, that's where the issue is joined. I said, the only, if you want to know my politics condensed to one sentence, the issue of which the line has to be drawn when there's no time for long conversations is to think out, is it morally right in your estimation that some people can impose their vision of the good by political force on others. That is the ultimate question about utopias. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I ha I'm really very, very touched by the reception you've given me. I'm really very, very touched. I've kind of been moving off in other worlds the last few years, and I didn't know how tonight would go. And 
If I gave you something of value, you gave me something of value. Thank you.